friends and welcome virtually to the Catholic community of St. Thomas More. My name is Amanda Bolaños and I am the pastoral associate intern at the church as well as a member of the Image and Likeness Committee. This event is brought to you by the Image and Likeness Committee of St. Thomas More, a ministry that yearns to deepen the Catholic understanding that all people are made in the image and likeness of God, as well as focusing on initiatives that involve racial healing and cultural diversity. I wanna thank you for joining us tonight and I extend my welcome to all, especially to those who are not Catholic as we gather in honor and celebration of Black History Month. I'd like to start with a prayer. So if you will join me as we begin. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. This prayer is from Psalm 139. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed sub substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you friends for joining us tonight. And now I will introduce our speakers. Tonight we are with Dolores and Lori Clark, a mother and daughter who are part of the first black family to reside in Carborough, North Carolina. Dolores Hogan Clark is part of the fourth generation of the Strayhorn Legacy, a family that has had, has, has had seven generations in Carborough, North Carolina thus far. Tonight, she will be talking about her great grandparents, Tony and Nellie, and their experiences in being the first black family in Carborough, North Carolina. Dolores used to be a pediatric nurse at Chapel Hill Pediatrics and at UNC Hospital. She helped organize a free evening clinic for black children that occurred for over 15 years. Dolores also enjoys working with her seasoned peers in the community. We also have with us her daughter, Lori, who is a part of the fifth generation of the Strayhorn legacy. Lori will be asking Dolores questions about the Strayhorn experience as part of tonight's presentation. Lori is a local community organizer and has worked for social justice in the Chapel Hill Carborough community of North Carolina for more than two decades. As a high school specialist, the Blue Ribbon Mentor Advocate Program in the Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools for 18 years, she provided opportunities for student growth with a focus in social justice. We are blessed and honored to be joined by Dolores and Lori Clark tonight, and we warmly welcome them to the virtual community of St. Thomas More and are excited to hear their stories and about their conversation regarding local history in the Chapel Hill Carborough area. I will now turn it over to Lori and Dolores. Good evening and welcome to the Strayhorn property. We're in Carborough, North Carolina, and we are actually sitting in the one room log cabin that my great great grandparents um, built. And I'm delighted to have my mom here. She just celebrated her 87th birthday um, and delighted that um, St. Thomas More has invited us to share our story. And so we believe that oral history and pre preserving your history is paramount to keeping your legacy going. And so I'm just going to have a conversation with my mom and invite you in, and I hope you enjoy it. So um, I want you to tell me, well, she did. Okay. So I want you to tell me about um, Tony, where Tony grew up. And I, I know it's not far from here, but where he grew up and how he ended up in Carborough. Uh, my great grandfather, uh, Tony Strayhorn, was born in Orange County. Uh, in 1850, he uh, was a slave, lived on the Strayhorn Plantation, which is about 60 miles um, from where we live now. And 
as a slave, uh, his mother uh, had two children, Tony and a sister. And I don't recall, we never uh, knew the name of his sister. Uh, however, he stayed on the plantation for a long, long time until he became an adult. And he uh, worked hard and tried to learn things. Uh, he couldn't learn, he wasn't taught to uh, read or write. However, he was taught some other things. Uh, so in growing up, uh, his mother uh, was taken away from him when he was seven years old. And uh, she, he never saw her again. But her last words were, be a good boy, be a good, good boy. And uh, he was, she was taken to Hillsborough and sold as a slave to another slave owner. So um, I, I just want, before my mom goes on, I just want to say that uh, when I was growing up, my grandmother used to say that we had family down east. But I never really knew what that meant until several years ago when we had a reunion and we were actually connected with the stray horns down east and learned that uh, some of the stray horns that came from the stray horn plantation in Hillsboro also migrated to Tennessee. So we've been able to connect with um, our stray horn relatives in the East and in Tennessee. So um, once Tony was, uh, once he grew up and came here, um, can you tell me how he, I know we talked about, you don't know how he met Nellie, but how they ended up getting married and settling here in Carver. Okay, I'm gonna uh, backtrack and say, uh, Tony's uh, master was to give us a stray horn. Um, that was his master. I never knew uh, the mistress. Uh, however, uh, when Tony was freed in 1865, um, I think he must have lived on the plantation uh, for some years. And then uh, he ventured out and uh, met my grand great grandmother, Nellie. And uh, Back then, uh, it was hard for, for them, but he met my, uh, my great-grandmother, Nellie. They uh, got together, they married in 1876, and they didn't have anything when they married. But uh, five years after the Civil War was ended, Tony uh, and Nellie went without shoes. They uh, sold vegetables and also, um, purchased land uh, where I live now, 30 acres of land in Carver. It wasn't anything here, just like a forest. So Tony um, cleared the forest. He built one room, a log cabin, one room. In that one room, they slept, ate, cooked, and did all of that in one room until they were able to add on. So. Uh, then what they did, how they made it, uh, they, like I said, they cleared the forest, they built a log cabin, and they planted crops. He became a farmer, and uh, they sold vegetables and milk and butter around in copper to other people. So the photo that you actually see on the screen um, is the house that we currently, my mom and, and I currently live in now. And so um, this photo here was taken around what time of the year? I would say probably in the 1890s. So this photo is in the 1890s. And can you briefly go over who might be in this, included in this photo? <laughs> well, I'm not exactly. Uh, on the horses are my uncles, my uncles Willis and after Barbie. My great-grandmother is on the right with the cow. And another family member is on uh, the left with the cow. Uh, my great grandfather, Tony, is the uh, gentleman you see standing in the back with the black suit on and a hat. And his daughter is right next to him. And right next to her in the middle is a, a cousin. And the other, the other lady to the right is Margie um, 
uh, Strayhorn that uh, Tony and Nellie's son married. And in front of her, for two of her children, and in front of my great grandmother, or her children, my mother's siblings, Horsey Dickens. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. And so um, you said that Tony moved to Carboro and um, met Nellie, married Nellie. They purchased 30, 30 acres, acres of land, of land yeah. um, here in Carboro. And we are actually uh, recording this in the one room log cabin. You'll be able to see photos of the log cabin later on. So tell me about life for Tony and Nellie. I know that they had two children. They had William and they had Sally. And so you talked about they were farmers. I think Tony was a brick mason. But before we go on, I'd like for you to talk about um, Tony, you know, teaching himself to read, because that's one of the things when I think about our legacy and how sometimes how difficult it is and some of the things that I want to instill in my kids, I want to talk about his resilience and how he taught himself to read. Okay, according to my great grandmother, uh, I got the history from my mother, uh, was passed on to me. Uh, was Tony, uh, after they built the home, they weren't, like I said before, uh, they weren't taught to read or write. So Tony uh, had faith. So he decided, I guess, to try to help himself, teach himself to read. So what he did, uh, uh, he would sit on the porch, back porch, uh, when the moon was out by the moonlight, and he taught himself to read. Uh, in teaching himself to read, he became a visionary leader in the community. Uh, he became a minister. He became a associate minister of the church, BFT and now a family church. He also was one of the first founders of First Baptist Church. Back then it was Rock Hill Baptist, and then was changed to First Baptist. So he, he was a visionary uh, leader in our community. Um, he also was very good in uh, doing brick masonry. He built chimneys all over Carver uh, for people. And he even built this home. He built this home alone, the whole the house that we live in. So he built this house basically room by room, right? Room so room. the one log cabin, and then they would add on, mm -hmm. you know, as the family grew. As he, uh, uh, as the family grew, he had a daughter and a son. Then he was able to uh, make additions to the home. So um, then as his children grew up, uh, he uh, gave his son uh house next door, well, built the house next door, and his daughter, he gave property, and she and her husband, my grandfather, built their home um, just adjacent to the farmhouse. So um, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, like the family gatherings. You would say that, you know, down the road or the hill, there was a farm and people would gather here and prepare for the winter and do canning and then go to Carmel Mall to mm -hmm. sell and trade. Can you talk a little bit about that? Okay, we, we owned a big farm, five and 30 acres. Uh, we had a very big uh, farm. I was able to work on some of the farm after I was born and became uh, a teenager. So uh, we, raised, we raised everything. We only purchased uh, coffee and sugar and flour from the store. Everything else was raised here on the farm. So um, then they would, they even raised cotton, which they would take um, to the mill. And also uh, they would have corn chuckins, uh, where some of the neighbors uh, from out in rural areas would come and they would all get my grandmother, great grandmother a big meal so they would have something to eat. So they shut corn and they carried the corn to Carmel, which is not far from where we live now. And the corn was ground into corn meal. So they uh, they didn't have to purchase a lot of things because they raised everything, all the meat, uh, the chickens and the hogs meat. 
and um, all the vegetables you, you could eat was raised on the farm. Now, I, I know you told me that you all had certain traditions and would sometimes get on me about ironing on Sunday and, and not being prepared. And so tell me, I know Tony passed away when you were um, three years old, right? No, but Tony okay. passed away December 2nd, 1934. Okay. And I was, I was born December 9th, 1933. So he passed away uh, a couple of days before I turned one year. Okay. And so I actually didn't know him that well. So then Nellie was instrumental in raising you yes. and your mother. My and my so father. can you um, talk a little bit about some of the values that she instilled in you? Okay. Uh, some of the values she instilled in me was, to, you know, always be kind to people, always love people, and always show politeness. And, uh, uh, you know, that really was back then. Uh, it was something that was very important to our family, is being kind to everyone and loving everyone and just uh, being helpful, sticking together and being helpful as families. And so um, I want you to just share a little more about Nellie, that, you know, we don't know a lot about Nellie, but we do know that she lived on the Atwater Plantation. Yes, she lived on the Atwater Plantation, but her her master was uh, Stroud, Brian Stroud was her master. And she lived on the plantation and as a young child and grew up. And uh, of course she had to work, she had to work on the plantation. So our mother would get up early in the morning and leave her with the children to take care of the children. And uh, so she, when she was, became, I guess, a teenager, she had to help on the farm and she would plow and she always uh, said that there was, uh, she could plow and the people, other people on the farm. Um, so she did all the hard work and, mm -hmm. and she said that she and her master, mistress, um, they made, made uh, prepared barrels of food for the soldiers. So, um, and sent the food to the soldiers. But uh, then she was able to, uh, help out at the at the house where Mass and Mistress live. But uh, she lived on the plantation, I guess, until she became an adult also. And um when you you there's a story in our family about when the Confederate soldiers, I'm sorry, not the Confederate soldiers, the Union soldiers came um to tell um the slaves that they were free. And can you talk a little bit about what Nellie shared about her experience when that happened? Okay, so Mary and her family worked in the fields a lot. Um, so when they were in the fields working this particular day, uh, they saw these soldiers coming up in uh, blue suits and she said in shiny brass buttons. And so they walked up to uh, her family, the ones that were in the field, and asked them if they knew they were freed. And she said, no, we did not know we were free. And, and they said, oh, yes, you are free. You are free. And she said, everybody started jumping around in the fields and throwing the shovels and throwing the holes and everything away, just jumping around, shouting. They were so glad to be free, 1865. Thank you for sharing that. That's important. That's very important. Um, so the other thing that I'd like to ask, we, you, how do you think um, Tony and, and Nellie not necessarily survived, but what, I mean, what drove them to be kind, to have compassion? You talk a lot about their faith. Um, and I know that they, they had very difficult lives growing up, right? Yes. But um, as parents, they instilled a lot of faith and hard work in their children, and um, which has been passed on to later generations. So talk a little bit about um, what you think their work ethic was. And so 
uh, Nellie lived for many years after Tony passed away, right? Yes. So how did she maintain this farm um, like by herself? And who did she rely on? And what do you think got her through? Well, I think what got her through and what got both of them through then was their faith in God. That was very important. Uh, Tony would get up every morning and gather his family and have prayer before they did any start of their day. So they had so much faith and Tony was, and both of them were devout Christians. Uh, they believed in helping people when they were able and they were believed in uh, caring, sharing. They, they had kindness in their hearts. They had lots of love for others. And uh, that's how they made it. So um, Tony was a brick mason yes. and a farmer. Yes. And um, so his daughter, Sally, mm -hmm. married a farmer who was a, a Barbie from Barbie's Chapel. That's another story. Um, but I want you to talk about how he taught his grandsons to mm -hmm. lay brick and um, the work that they did throughout Harbor and Chapel Hill. Oh, so how he taught my uncles, which is my mother's sisters, uh, how to do the work they did. Uh, brick mason work, they did uh, plaster work, and he taught uh, the men in the family, my mother's siblings, how to do all that. And um, they were able to take that on in their, for, in the, you know, for their career. So um, he, he was just a good teacher. Do you know any places in Carborough or Chapel Hill where they've laid brick that still remains? Okay, one place in particular in Carver is the Central Center. Okay. That's one of the places that my great grandfather had built. And Chapel Hill, my uncles, Willis and Alfred Barbie, um, they have built so many things around uh, the campus of the UNC campus mm -hmm. and, and other parts of Chapel Hill and Carver also. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were well known, and my great grandfather was well known. My great grandfather, grandmother was well known because people uh, had respect for them. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of respect, and that's what was important. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else about Nellie and Tony that you would like to share? I think I may have well, a I think few more missed, questions. We missed about uh, um, when neighbors would come by from the rural mm -hmm. area, uh, they would stop by. Uh, and we had a well, we have a well and yard still there, uh, but we don't use it. However, uh, people would stop by just to stop and say hello and have a conversation mm -hmm. because they knew the straight ones were good people and they love people. So they would stop by on their way to um, Arbor or to Chapel Hill and get a drink of water and just have a little conversation. And then they'd be headed on their way. And so what um, was, and I don't know if I alluded to this before, but what was life like for you? Um, I mean, was it difficult? I, I know you all were farmers. Did you have a lot of money? I mean, so, and were you all happy or was it hard work? No, uh, we, didn't, we, didn't own, we didn't have a lot of money. We got money from my husband. Uh, great grandparents from mm -hmm. farming. Mm -hmm. That's how they made money. Now, after they were freed and my great grandmother uh, started, uh, that's before she got married, mm -hmm. she said she uh, worked for a lawyer in Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. She only got $5 a month. And the $5 that she received that month went to her father. Mm -hmm. So no, they didn't have a lot of money. But they, like I said, they had faith, they had love for each other. So uh, that's how they made it. And I know recently, um, since we've been cleaning out because we've had time due to COVID, we found some receipts that um, Tony had purchased his daughter an organ and paid, I think, $5 a month. $5 a month, yes. Uh, my grandmother, Sally, Tony's daughter uh, was, was a musician. She played the organ at church every Sunday 
and she taught herself how to play. Mm -hmm. So she played the organ in church every Sunday. She was um, the pianist there, the organist. And my great grandfather, uh, was Tony, was he was the superintendent, he was the associate pastor, and just a leader. And they taught Sunday school and just a Bible scholar. He was, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. he taught himself to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. So uh, we found, uh, mm -hmm. actually, found the Bible, one of his Bibles not long ago, uh, and also a Bible of my grandmother, mm -hmm. Sally. Uh, my grandmother, uh, they, were, they went to church every Sunday. Uh, they were faithful members. And she made uh, the communion bread mm -hmm. that they served. So they all played a big part in role in the church. Mm -hmm. And my great grandfather, he played a huge role in communion because he was uh, just a minister man and just a good man. So I know you've lived in this house for many years. Um, and you preserved it, you know, so there are seven, seven generations. And so um, the photo that you see on the screen is um, actually the one room log cabin, which is where we are. And my mom has, um, with the help of many people in this community, been able to preserve this land, this house, which we are so grateful for. Um, so do you want to talk about what carrying on your grandparents' legacy and um, the preservation of this house means to you? Okay, my great-grandparents, Tony and Nellis Trahon, they reminded me of the value of our whole family and the many treasures in their lives. And I was truly enlightened by the struggles and the hardship and the survival they uh that occurred during slavery days. Uh, I love this home and uh, I promised my mother that I would always live here as long as I live. So um, it's just an honor. I've had people to really help me. It's been hard trying to uh, preserve it, but uh, through, the, through faith in God, I've had uh, the town of Carver have really helped me uh, preserve it and also uh, Chapel Hill Preservation Society earned a dollar, uh, helped me a lot. Uh, so you're instrumental in helping me. Get, and also, and people have been very gracious uh, in, in, you know, in helping me uh, keep things going. And I appreciate that so much. I really do. So um, what is one thing that you'd like to share with people about the value of preserving your history and about oral history. I'm so grateful that we have this opportunity for me to sit with my mom and for her to share with me. And for those of you that are on this evening about our family's legacy. And so um, what I've been doing lately when my mom and I have conversation is I record her because I think that that's valuable and I want to be able to preserve our family history. So for, for people that are watching, um, what do you think what do you think they should do to preserve their family history and why is it important? I think it's very important to preserve uh, family history. I have gotten together a book of, in the, from the very beginning of stories that I was told that my mother, uh, passed on to me and I have made um, a book, a whole book, and I'm still working on it now, of the things that she taught me and the things that I actually heard from my grandmother. She taught me uh, when she was alive. So, because she raised me in this home. So, um, uh, I think that when, when there are family gatherings uh, at Thanksgiving, Christmas, or whenever, July 4th, uh, if families could just talk about the, their history mm -hmm. and get it together and write it down, mm -hmm. and it's it's very important uh, to know, you know, where your great grandparents, your mm -hmm. great great grandparents, grandparents came from, and even as the children are growing now, they might uh, ask mommy 
uh, how did what did you do when you grew up or uh, whatever if you write down everything just when you're thinking about something jot it down uh, like i said at family gatherings mm -hmm. talk about things and your uncles and aunts and great grandparents and grandparents talk about family mm -hmm. and see who has pictures or who has some information that mm -hmm. you can gather together and, and uh, you know then when you have things like that and you go back and you can go through your book or whatever mm -hmm. and the it's interest is really history is really interesting and i really do enjoy writing it and uh, but i would encourage people to please please write your family history mm -hmm. pass it on to your to the next generation then let them pass it on to the next generation. So uh, I value that so much. Is there anything else you want to share just about your upbringing? I have a question. I think I would like to know from you if Tony and Nellie were alive today, what would they tell their great-great-grandchildren about being faithful and just about life in general? I think they would tell them about the values of the family uh, and and about having faith and how to, you know, carry on and how to preserve or continue to preserve history. Uh, I think they would say that. And this particular uh, oh, no. photo that she's showing now, I apologize. But one of my grandchildren is missing. Her name is Nevea. She wasn't in this picture, but I apologize for that. She uh, she just, wasn't born yet. There she is in the corner, then. Oh yeah, there yeah, she I'm is. I'm sorry, she's in the corner. But I just <laughs> we were going through that earlier. I just know that. so I have ten grandchildren, but I actually one of them is not on there. One of the oldest one is not on there, but Nevea is. She's the oh yes, yeah, she is on there. So I have ten grandchildren. I'm really proud of my grandchildren. I have two great grandchildren, uh, Jaleer and Braylon. Uh, they are two and three. So uh, I'm just, I love my family so much and uh, just for them, I just love them, love them. But uh, if you could just, uh, just get family together, talk about things. It's, it's a lot of, it's educational and it's fun. It's, it's a lot of fun uh, uh, to me. I have enjoyed every moment of what I was taught when I was growing up. And uh, to this day, I value everything that I was taught from my grandmother and from my mother. And, you know, I will always treasure it uh, as long as I'm on this earth. And so that's interesting that you talked about, you know, you, you will value what they taught you and, mm -hmm. you know, you will, you shared that Tony taught himself to read and yeah. that Nellie probably did not have an education. Nellie did not have any education. She couldn't read or write. So uh, she relied on her husband, Tony, to take care of everything. Uh, she, and she praised him for that, for just going out, sitting on the porch at night, because then, you know, you weren't allowed to have lights in your home mm -hmm. because of uh, the you know different people riding on horseback trotting back to see if a light was burning your house mm -hmm. so you weren't allowed to have lights on in your house so that's how he taught him still just to go and sit in on the porch in the moonlight and i i know that must have been hard but mm -hmm. trying to you know see uh and make but he he made it he uh he became uh like i said he but earlier he became associate pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, he became a founder of uh, the Rock Hill Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a mason. And he uh, became a master's in Orange County. A magistrate mm -hmm. in Orange County. And uh, he did a lot of things in the community. And I mean, just from just teaching himself, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm on the slave plantation, they weren't allowed to teach uh, the Black children. And I know one of my favorite stories that you shared is about Nellie only getting, um, is it one pair of shoes or, and how they had 
to make their dresses. I can't imagine that, but um, mm -hmm. I always find the story really very intriguing. Will you share that? Okay, when Nana was growing up, um, they they only had uh, one pair of shoes a year, and she stated that her master made the shoes. Mm -hmm. They had to go barefoot it everywhere they went. They had to go even to church. They went mm -hmm. to barefoot it. Okay, so the the mistress made their clothes, mm -hmm. so they only got they they wore one dress in the winter, then in the summer they would take off. And put on a, another dress. Mm -hmm. I take off their the yarn undershirt. So, uh, but that's that's what happened to them. Mm -hmm. And they had even uh, they went to church, but they had the uh, they had to uh, sit outside. They mm -hmm. couldn't go in the church. They went to church barefoot. Mm -hmm. They had to sit outside on the bench until their mistress and master came uh, out of church. And that happened with uh, my great grandmother and great grandfather. I know the other day you and I were talking about um, you were wondering how they went to church. Like, did they go? In, did they walk, or did they go in a horse and buggy? Um, and we just we don't have that information, do we? No, but I, I'm thinking they went in horse and buggy. They didn't have no cars back right then, so they went in horse and buggy. I would think. Mm -hmm. Uh, either they would walk. Or they would walk. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, do I have any other questions? I don't know if it's time for us to entertain any questions that people might have at this time. Um, but this has been an interesting conversation. And it's, you know, again, it's so important to know and to understand your family's history. And so the photos on the screen um, as my mom shared earlier, that is in like the early 1900s uh, because my grandmother is in that photo and she was a little girl. Um, and the house, the photo on the right is the house as it currently stands. And um, so I want to just acknowledge my mom for her perseverance and her dedication to make sure that this house remains in our family and all the things that she's done to make sure um, that, you know, the interior for the, for the most part and the exterior um, meets the standards of state registry because it is on the state registry. I know that we've been trying to get it on the national registry. Um, not quite sure what happened with that. But anyway, so, you know, when I think about Tony and Nellie, you know, it just, it really baffles me to know that back then he was able to purchase 30 acres of land um, here in Carver, pretty much from uh, PTA or now Community Works, almost all the way down to Owasa and then back down Laurel Avenue is all the acreage that was Strayhorn land. And um, my mom shared that Tony's son will built a house next door, um, right next door to the community works. And then Sally and her family built a house a few yards down Jones Ferry, which is a brick house. And that's where she raised her family. Um, the one thing my mom didn't share is that Sally passed away early. And so some of the children lived in the rock house on Jones Ferry and some came to live here with Nellie, right? Right, too. Yeah. And I just want to say that uh, uh, I have lived here most of my life and uh, I am just feel so honored to know that my great grandparents worked so hard for the land and, and built this home and and it's just a treasure to me and uh, I just I'm just so grateful uh, that you know it has remained in our family for all these years. So do you have any parting <laughs> words of wisdom about 
family history or what you hope your grandchildren and great grandchildren will do to carry on this history and to preserve our home place? Well, I hope that they would listen uh, to the stories being told, mm -hmm. for one thing, and other families do the same thing. Uh, and like I said before, jot down things. If someone tells you about what happened years ago, jot it down and bring it together. Uh, and, you know, and enjoy, enjoy it, uh, and be thankful for what your ancestors have passed on to you. I'm very grateful for it to this day. So, um, but we have so much, this is not all the history. There's a lot more mm -hmm. to be learned. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't tell it all right now, it's just too much. And uh, like I said, I've, I've written my story, my part of what I've learned uh, growing up in this home uh, and all the beautiful things that happened, you know, I'm just so grateful for that. So uh, I just hope that other people will do the same, mm -hmm. same. Enjoy your families. It's important. And so um, I just, you know, you shared a lot about Nellie and Tony, but your life is fascinating too. And the one thing that I always like to lift up is you know your work in the community, but even just you know what I value is that the stories that you share about walking to school and about how rich um, Carborough was and um, how much family there was, and you would stop at different places in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and eat food or or see people. And so, just talk a little bit about you know you walking to school from here. Um, and what school was like. I know you graduated from Lincoln High. <laughs> I did. Uh, growing up, um, it was it was all right. Uh, the neighbors, we were like, we were on a black family in Copper a long, long time, but we had uh, white neighbors and the neighbors that we had, uh, they were good people. I must say they were good people. Uh, it, we were like family living across the street and adjacent to our home, uh, it was like family, you know, they never ridiculed us and uh, they were always loving and shared things and together. Uh, then we had, growing, my growing up uh, was a little bit hard in the beginning because uh, my school was so far away, about a mile. I went to a school called Orange County Training School, which is uh, right off Church Street in Chapel Hill. Uh, until around the 11th grade, and then uh, graduated 12th grade, but uh, it was converted to Lincoln High at that time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we had uh, we had to walk to school in the rain, whatever, sleep, whatever it was. Uh, we couldn't ride the, a bus because uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was segregated. Mm -hmm. uh, school was hard because we didn't have things like the white schools had. Mm -hmm. uh, we had old books with no backs, pages going out of the books. Uh, but we had good teachers and we survived. And um, our teachers, um, they saw to it that we had a very good education, mm -hmm. which I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was very hard uh, having to walk to school and walk home from school every day. And right, not even about a half a block from my home, this home I'm in now, it was a school that I could not attend. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to continue to go to Orange County Training School and then graduate from Lincoln High. But uh, like I said, it was hard, but uh, we survived. There were hard times. But like I said, through faith, well, we survived. Mm -hmm. and, and so I know that um, your mother had several siblings and um, and those siblings really only had one child each. Yeah. And so, you know, you didn't have any siblings, but mm -hmm. your cousins were like your siblings. Can you talk a little bit about what life was like for you all and how you played? You <laughs> shared a lot with me about how you all relied on each other and took care of each other. And I think that's important fa uh, family values. Yeah, we. it was uh, like you just said, uh, most of my cousins were just 
will be either a boy or a girl uh, in each uh, one of my mother's siblings. Uh, so, but we were family, we were good family. We played together because everybody was right here, uh, either next door, uh, a couple of yards of feet mm -hmm. from here. And so we played, you know, we had games. We didn't have things like movies or television. Or, I don't think we even had a radio. So uh, we did things to entertain ourselves, playing games in the yard and just, uh, you know, maybe eventually when we got to be teenagers, we were able to get Santa Claus for us a bicycle. So we were able to ride our bikes. But uh, I mean, we were, we were happy, mm -hmm. although we didn't have anything much. But we were happy just, just gathering around and playing with us. And uh, then uh, the family across the street, families, they were white. They would come over and play with us. And we would go in, you know, to their home sometimes. But uh, we we just grew up like that. But nobody, we didn't complain. We couldn't complain mm -hmm. because when anything, it wouldn't happen, you know, for us to have things that the white children mm -hmm. had. So is one more story that I want you to share that is, you know, very dear to my heart. Um, and I just can never imagine it. But a lot of people probably don't know that you were inflicted with polio. And so I just want you to share that day, how you went to school and how you came home um, and how your cousins helped you. Yeah. Well, at the age of 16, I was a junior in high school. Uh, and um, I went to, I woke up one morning, I, I did feel well, but I was able to get up, get dressed anyway. And uh, uh, as I walked out of the house uh, to get on, back then I was able to ride the bus, mm -hmm. which had just happened about maybe a year before that. Uh, I couldn't I couldn't get up the steps on the bus. So my cousin, uh, we were all very close to my cousin then. So he helped me get on the bus and went to school and I couldn't hardly make it in school. Mm -hmm. My legs were very, very weak. and uh, But I made it through the day and I had to be helped back on the bus. And then when I got home, helped in the house. And as soon as I entered the door to my home, uh, I fell on the floor. And my mother was a nurse, so uh, she was at work. And my granny, my great-grandmother, Nellie, she was here, but she was in age. She couldn't do that much. We didn't have a telephone, so nobody could call. Uh, for emergency. Um, so I had to just lie there until my mother came from work about five o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, mm -hmm. she, uh, you know, she discovered that I couldn't walk. My legs had just given out. And so I, she uh, rushed me to, they rushed me to Duke Hospital in uh, Durham. And, mm -hmm. and then they diagnosed me as having polio. Uh, and I was paralyzed all the way from waist down. Uh, for over six or seven months, wasn't able to go back to school and um, was in my junior year. But however, my teachers were very nice. My friends were nice. They would come and bring me homework. And um, so I made it. So I went to, back to school, I think about six or seven mm -hmm. months later and was able to graduate from my class. So um, God was good. People were praying. Mm -hmm. They were really praying, praying for my recovery. And uh, so uh, I made it, I made it. <laughs> and the other story that um, is, you know, really makes me sad is the story about your cousin, Lucy, who mm -hmm. had just gone to college. Can you talk about his accident and what happened? Mm -hmm. So my cousin, we call him, his name was Willis Barber Jr. Um, he got a full scholarship to uh, Marstown College in Marstown, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Went out to college and there for a couple of months, and uh, he was a football player. He got a scholarship for football. Uh, so uh, they came through Chapel Hill, and he stopped and uh, his, uh, for a while. And then uh, his mother had prepared a meal for him and some of his friends. So uh, about in the late evening, that same day, we got a call that he had been injured, and um, so my his father and his mother and my and I, myself, and my mother, and his grandmother, uh, drove to Elizabeth City, North Carolina, uh, where he was injured. So when we got there, he was in the hospital. Um, uh, he had a broken neck, mm -hmm. 
And he then, uh, but he knew us when we got there, but he only lasted about 30 minutes after we got there. So um, he passed away and that was very hard, hard for all of us. But I think what is important is, you know, you said that he wasn't able to get the care that he, he was. It was a small community hospital. So back then, you know, they didn't have the, the everything. Uh, they medical technology wasn't like it is today. But did they deny him at one hospital and send him yes, to another? Yes. Okay. So, um, so uh, he was uh, not able to get you know in good care. I think he probably would uh, would survive if he had gone to a more you know a larger hospital. Mm -hmm. But this little hospital was so small and. But uh, they didn't have the equipment to him. Mm -hmm. So he passed away just first year of college. So I think we're almost out of time. And um, I, so I appreciate you taking this time to share our family history. And I hope you all have been engaged and have enjoyed it. And um, we'll elevate Black history, not just mm -hmm. during Black History Month, but, you know, be more. Um, cognizant about learning about your local Black history and, um, and national history, but, you know, preserving your family history is important. I'm really grateful that I still have my mom here to share these stories with me, that, that technology allows us to record it, um, and also the fact that she is working on her book. So now um, I would like to thank uh, we would like to thank St. Thomas More yeah, thank you, for Thomas this Moore. invitation to be with you this evening. We'll turn it over to Amanda, and um, she may have a few questions for us. Write your story. Don't forget. Jot it down. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both so much. That was absolutely beautiful and incredible. And um, Dolores and Lori, just what a witness. Um, one of the comments, I'll just say this, says you must come back in person when the time is right um, as part of your book tour, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, that's all the time we have tonight, friends. Um, I first would like to thank everyone for joining us as we honor and celebrate Black History Month. And thank you to Lori and Dolores for taking the time to share your, your wisdom and your grace with us. It's been such a privilege to listen to you this evening. And thank you. I'm very grateful for your words of wisdom, both of you. Um, if anyone has any concerns or questions, please feel free to email me, Amanda Bolaños. Um, I'll put my email in the Facebook comments. And don't forget to join us next week as we continue our speaker series. Next Monday, we will be joined by Principal Jared Smith, who is the principal at St. Thomas More Academy in Washington, DC. Um, and we're very grateful. But Dolores and Lori, thank you again um, for your beautiful words and ultimately a message of hope. May everyone continue to record and tell their stories. Um, but we wish everyone a great rest of their night. Please stay safe and know that you're in our prayers. Thank you both. And thank, thank you. you for the invitation.